Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Andrew Norfolk to the stage. Thank you. Um, on a Friday afternoon, just over five years ago in August 2010, I'd taken a, a long weekend. I was driving through the Scottish borders en route to Edinburgh, uh, and a news item came on the radio. Um, court case had just finished at Manchester Crown Court, not far from here. Nine men had been found guilty of multiple sex offences against one 14-year-old girl. She'd been befriended and then passed around these men for sex. And there was an exchange um, between the young reporter outside the court and the presenter in the studio in London. The presenter clearly knew as little about the case as I did because I'd not heard anything about it um, until the item came on. The presenter was saying, this sounds terrible. These are horrific offences. What, what was it about these nine men? Did, did, did they know each, how did they know each other? Did they have anything in common? And there was an embarrassed silence, and the young reporter um, sort of went, uh, um, no, I don't think there's any suggestion that these men had anything in common. Now, they hadn't named the men, and I sat there in my car, knowing nothing about the case, thinking very uneasily, I bet I know something these men have in common. Um, this was 2010. I I'd started on the Times in London in 2000. I moved up to Leeds in 2003 as North East correspondent. And as the years passed, I'd begun to notice what seemed to be a similarity between a number of little cases that were cropping up. Um, stories that would come across your desk, local newspaper reports, press agency articles. Um, cases where a number of men, two or more men, were being convicted of sex offences against girls who were almost always aged 12 to 15. Um, the first meeting had been in a public place. It, it wasn't people they knew. It was a meeting in a, a bus station in a shopping mall on a street corner. And these kids, young adolescents who were wanting to be treated as more grown up than they were, a lot of them from pretty tough backgrounds, um, were going through an initial befriending, grooming process and then alcohol, drugs, um, being lured into a world where they were suddenly completely out of their depth. And in the worst cases, were being put into cars, taken to houses for so-called parties, um, and a lot of men were waiting to have sex with them. Um, there was one other thing the, these cases had in common. Um, it was very difficult to avoid noticing that the names of almost all the offenders were, were Muslim names. And that was really weird, because almost every form of sexual offending against children that we know in this country is overwhelmingly white men usually acting on their own. Um, abuse in the family, in institutions, against boys, against prepubescent girls, online. White, white, white. Um, but this was different, and yet each case was being treated as a one-off. Totally isolated, no pattern. And that day in the car and in the borders, I said to myself, and when I get back to Leeds, I'm going to check. And if these nine men are Muslim names, then I'm, finally I've got to get over my fear that this is a story it's impossible to cover because it is the far right's dream story. Innocent white girls, evil, dark skinned men. How do you cover that? But I can't carry on ignoring it. And sure enough, when I got back, I looked up. It was indeed, as, as I'd thought. Um, the next day, I sent a very long email to the news editor in London. Um, said, look, I think there's something going on here. We need to look into it. Will you give me some time? And he gave me what turned out to be three months. Most of that time was spent trawling online, searching through newspaper, archives in local libraries, trying to find cases that fitted the, the pattern. Not, nothing to do with the names of the men who were being convicted, but the cases that fitted that model. And we came up in the end with 17 cases since the late 90s, 13 different towns and cities, 56 men convicted. Three of the 56 were white, 53 were Asian names, 50 of them were Muslim names, and when we looked into each case, the overwhelming majority were Pakistani Muslims. 
OK, so we had a kind of evidential base, but what the hell are you going to do about it? Um, we needed to start talking to people, and so I tried to start talking to police forces, to specialists, to experts who would look after children, um, to government departments, and there was a complete wall of silence. All we get, if anything, were, were the terse statement, you know, ethnicity, culture has absolutely no relevance whatsoever to this pattern of offending. Um, in the end, I found one small charity which worked with the families of victims, and through them, I got to know some of the families and to understand that the court cases where people were actually being prosecuted were actually a tiny, tiny minority, because in most cases, Parents had been trying really hard to get help for their kids. They were going and knocking on doors. They were pleading with social services, with police to do something, and nothing was happening. Um, eventually, um, we were ready to publish, and we published that first story in January 2011. Um, the whole of the front page and four pages inside. Within a few days, the government had ordered a national inquiry. Um, within two days, Jack Straw, the former Home Secretary, went on Newsnight and said that some young Pakistani men in his Blackburn constituency viewed white girls as easy meat, which created further headlines. I was called down to London for my very first ever one-to-one -one meeting with the editor of The Times. Um, I'd been told he was quite pleased with the impact of the story, and I thought I was going to get a pat on the back and be told I'd done a good job. Um, instead, he told me this was now going to be my full-time job. I thought we'd done it, but he said we were going to carry on keeping running stories about this until and he pointed from his office out through the glass around into the newsroom until the day comes when every single one of your colleagues arrives for work one morning, picks up the front page of the Times and says, oh my God, not another bloody story about child sexual exploitation. That's the day, he said, when I'll know we're finally starting to make a difference. You're going to carry on writing about this until we're satisfied that every public body in England has the knowledge and systems in place to protect children and prosecute offenders however long it takes. Well, it took four years. Um, we told more individual family stories. One of the very first was uh, from a grandfather who rang from Rotherham, who wanted to talk about his granddaughter. Um, one month after her 13th birthday, she'd gone to school and then gone missing, and the school had rung her mum, who'd immediately rung the police who'd said, don't worry, love, she'll turn up as soon as she gets hungry. Um, she didn't turn up that afternoon, that evening. And at 2.30 in the morning, the next morning, a woman on the other side of Rotherham had picked up the phone and dialed 999 because she'd heard a young girl screaming in the house next door. Police had gone round to the house. They found this 13-year-old girl with another young girl. She was almost completely naked, she was blind drunk, and she was with seven adult Pakistani men. She was drunk and leery. And South Yorkshire police arrested the 13-year-old girl for being drunk and disorderly. They took her back to the station, put her in the cells, eventually charged her, and she was convicted. They didn't even question the men as to why they were in a house with a 13-year-old girl who was nearly naked in the early hours of the morning. Another early story was about Rochdale, and in the spring of 2012 came the first big court case we covered. Um, by now, this pattern and this story was getting quite a lot of attention, but there were still many days when we were the only newspaper in court. Um, it was a trial that lasted several weeks, and on one of those days, we learned something pretty extraordinary. One of the victims was a girl from Essex, but she'd been put into a children's home in Rotherham, and she was the only resident of that children's home. I'd never heard of solo care children's homes. In two months in that home, she'd gone missing 15 times, 
periods ranging from a day to a fortnight. And on one of those missing nights, she'd been taken to a house, put blind drunk in an upstairs bedroom, and cars had started arriving from all across Greater Manchester. Men were queuing on the stairs and on the landing outside the bedroom. And the jury heard that 50 men had had sex with that girl in one night. She was a child. When I looked into this children's home, it turned out that Rochdale had more than 40 solo care homes each supposedly offering specialist 24-7 care to one child. Essex County Council was paying more than £250,000 a year to place that child there. We discovered a whole pattern of private care companies, many of them owned by private equity firms, buying very cheap properties in the North and the Midlands. And vulnerable kids were being shipped up from London and the South East. Private companies were charging extortionate prices. And these kids were being placed, many of them, right smack bang in the middle of sex grooming hotspots. That story is just one example of some of the spin offs that came along the four years, but it led to an urgent government review, a significant shake up of children's home regulations. By now, more and more criminal inquiries were being launched, but I kept coming back to Rotherham because something about what what the police had done in that house really troubled me. We told and got to know some families so well in that town, and I got to know the case files, and it just seemed extraordinary that the authorities knew so much and did so little. I couldn't work out if it was just these isolated cases I was hearing about or whether it was something more. And eventually came the big breakthrough for, for the investigation, without question the most single important day, which was the day I drove to an address somewhere in South Yorkshire. I waited and eventually another car drove up. I opened my boot, the driver opened theirs, and two very large sagging cardboard boxes were transferred from their car to mine. Inside those boxes were hundreds of confidential documents internal papers, police intelligence reports, social services case files. Those papers gave us the chance to tell a very detailed and damning story how for more than a decade, South Yorkshire Police and Rotherham Council had known exactly what was happening. They knew the girls, they knew the names of the men, their nicknames, their home addresses, their car registration numbers, the places they were taking these children, and they had effectively sat back, shrugged their shoulders and done nothing. In my um, naivety, I thought that when we published that story in September 2012, those at the top of those two organisations would be so shocked and ashamed and horrified that they would immediately announce inquiries to try to get to the bottom of what had happened. Rotherham Council was indeed horrified, and an inquiry was launched, but not into their own failings. All they wanted to know was how we would got hold of the documents. They'd already tried to get a High Court injunction to block an earlier story. Now they asked the police to launch a criminal inquiry into the leak. They also hired a firm of its solicitors to investigate the security breach. As for the police, they not only dismissed all criticism, but publicly accused the Times of exploiting the victims. Those authorities were in complete denial, so we kept digging, and a year later, in August 2013, we published the story that eventually shamed the council into commissioning the independent inquiry, whose report was published in August last year. Rufus was telling you about it. It wasn't just the numbers, 1,400 children. It was the clear evidence the inquiry had found of horrific crimes having been ignored or suppressed by the authorities. As Rufus said, suddenly Rotherham became headline news globally. China, Australia, Canada, you name it. 
And when I think back to what the editor said to me four years ago, um, we're going to keep on until the, the council's chief executive told a parliamentary um, committee in evidence that the reason the council felt forced to commission that inquiry that ended up having such huge repercussions was because, quote, the times wouldn't leave us alone. In the outcry that ensued, several senior people lost their jobs. Then the ruling Labour cabinet resigned en masse. Finally, the local authority was found not fit for purpose, and it's now run by a team of government-appointed commissioners. I think this story is an example of why newspapers matter. For years and years, people in that town had been desperately concerned by what was going on. They tried their very best to raise the alarm. Young girls and their families had pleaded with the police. Frontline workers told their bosses. Internal reports were written, seminars held. Letters sent to chief constables, MPs, government departments, and absolutely nothing changed. And finally, when all else failed, someone very brave decided in desperation to place their trust in journalism. Those documents I was handed revealed something shameful, something people in power, people whose job it supposedly was to protect children, had chosen to keep safely hidden. It was, for obvious reasons, a very uncomfortable story to put on the front page of a national newspaper, but, but it was true. And sometimes it really is the uncomfortable truths that are the ones it's most important for journalists to tell, because if we don't, no one else will. On my own, I could have done exactly the same work as I've done these past five years, and it would have achieved precisely nothing. I could have posted blogs, I could have stood and shouted on street corners. It wouldn't have changed anything. But this wasn't me alone. This was the Times, which showed an extraordinary level of commitment and trust in allowing one of its staff reporters to pursue a single investigation for such a long time. And because it was the Times that kept running those stories, people listened. It wasn't the sort of story that immediately makes people rush out to buy newspapers. It exposed us, particularly in the early months, to some severe criticism, to accusations of racism. Our motivation was questioned, but we kept going. And we ended up giving a voice to some pretty invisible kids. And those articles have, I think, ended up changing the way this country responds to and tackles the sexual exploitation of children by groups of men. Some children, I hope, are safer as a result. That is journalism in the public interest. And to have had a chance to play a role in that process makes me a very lucky person. Thank you.